In the chaotic early hours of October 7, Israeli forces scrambled to engage Hamas fighters. Apache helicopter gunships fired onto cars driving towards Gaza, aware that some of them were carrying captives. aware that some of them were carrying captives. Oh, I've been muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I love you guys anyway for showing up. I've been muted this whole time. Wow, I made it a whole, what, two and a half minutes being muted? That's impressive. That's impressive. Um, anyway. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's start over. Uh, when you guys, I saw you guys saying no sound, but that's because I was playing the other video at first without sound intentionally. And I thought that's what you guys were talking about. So I need full sentences here, folks. You have to say, you no sound. You have no sound. <laughs> okay, here we go again. This is footage that has just come out from uh, Al Jazeera, but it's, it was taken obviously by the idea of showing them obliterating vehicles uh, as they go on October 7th, uh, let's let's play a little bit of this. In the chaotic early hours of October 7, Israeli forces scrambled to engage Hamas fighters. <laughs> Apache helicopter gunships fired onto cars driving towards Gaza, aware that some of them were carrying captives. He says, I was in the air during one of the sorties and they said there were no, there were, there were abductees. The interviewer asked them, what do you do? He says, good question, super complex dilemma. But this is exactly what so many of us have been saying for months, that Israel was operating under the, and continues to operate under the Hannibal Directive, which is kill everyone, kill the hostages, kill the people taking the hostages, kill everyone around the hostages, kill them all. And this is exactly what they did. And now we have the footage that proves it. And yet so many of us, especially in independent media who were willing to cover this stuff, so many of us have, were, were, were called, you know, uh, uh, Hamas uh, propagandists and everything else, uh, all this garbage we, we were called. And yet here is the footage of the IDF just blowing up cars. They don't know who's in them. They don't know if there's hostages in the cars. And this is why there were hundreds, I mean, literally hundreds of vehicles blown up on October 7th and 8th. And I'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> He says, this IDF pilot says, yes, the whole decision is on us, is on the pilot as to whether to blow up a car you see down on the ground. Without guidance, some pilots said they joined local WhatsApp groups to help pick targets. The idea that pilots have to get information from WhatsApp groups is truly remarkable. It's a sign of the initiative that people are looking for any way that they can get the information. This is an outrage. I mean, what kind of a way is that to fight a modern war? At least 70 vehicles were hit by attack helicopters. Uh, so he says 70 were hit by attack helicopters. By the way, thank you so much. Obs uh, observate, uh, you rock for the donation. Can't thank you enough uh, for 
that your donations keep this show going. And really the super chats have been so helpful. You guys, thank you so much. Uh, but yeah, he said, so he says 70 vehicles, but in fact, it was more than 70. If you count the ones, the, the vehicles that were just shot to hell with bullets, he said 70, he said 70 were hit by, uh, helicopters. And I, I mean, think that means excusable for mainly for explosives, anyway, but, uh, if you don't know what that target is. So I want to show you, and, and we'll come back to some of this footage in a moment, but I want to show you, and I brought this to this story to you before, but of course your mainstream media completely ignores it. Uh, what, what was done to those cars, those hundreds of cars? Let's see, where is it? I thought I had it up here. Maybe I don't. Oh, there it is. Oh, too many tabs open. Sorry about that. So here's an article, and this is a this is an Israeli propagandist rag, but even they are reporting it that that uh, hundreds of cars. Israel plans to bury hundreds of cars with ashes and blood stains. So obviously, this would be, if you wanted to have a legitimate uh, investigation into what happened on October 7th, what actually went down, who killed who, how it went down, you would want to have all of this evidence. You would definitely want to see these cars, want to see what type of bullets ended up penetrating these cars, perhaps what uh, what blood is on the cars, what, whether they were burned or not, whether they were hit by an explosive or not. There's so many things about these hundreds of vehicles that you would want to know. Israel is shredding them and burying them. And again, this is an article from a uh, Jerusalem propaganda newspaper, and yet it's covering this story uh, and it, and here's the reason. Initially, the reason that Israel gave for why they were going to shred and bury all of the cars was environmental reasons. It's just good for the environment to get rid of these uh, hundreds of vehicles with tons of evidence on them. But now it seems that at least some of them have switched to a new reason. Uh, this is from Zaka Tel Aviv. Zaka is the propaganda. They're kind of like the white helmets in Syria. They're a propaganda uh, emergency group who goes in, and I don't doubt they help some people, but while they're helping people, they're also making up stories. Much of it has been debunked. You know, they some of the stories about like beheaded babies and stuff that's all been debunked came from them. So they're, they're just a propagandist outlet or organization. But uh, one of the organization's units is dedicated to, quote, ensuring the dignity, ensuring dignity and death. So that's why they're shredding and burying in an undisclosed location all of the vehicles that would prove that these vehicles were blown up by the IDF, not by Hamas. Uh, I'm not saying Hamas didn't shoot anyone. I want to be clear on that. Uh, I, I think anyone who says that is out of their goddamn minds. But these cars, many of them were blown up from the sky by the IDF. And these were cars, many of them didn't have any Hamas fighters or anything in them. Many of them were people just, for example, the most killing was at the the, the, the proportion or percentage wise was at the Nova Music Festival, right? Hundreds of people killed. And many of them were in cars trying to leave the festival. The roads were blocked. And what happened to those cars? Well, here's an image of some of the cars before they've been uh, shredded and buried. Thank goodness, at least we have this, even if we're not going to get the actual forensic evidence. But you'll notice Several of the cars clearly hit by massive explosives. I mean, you, you can see a car here, roof caved in, entire thing flattened. You see multiple cars that are not hit by bullets, which seem to be the weapons that almost exclusively Hamas had, but instead blown up from the sky, uh, these these uh, the, the, these IDF orders to just blow up the cars that were leaving the Nova Music Festival. And again, you can see it with your own eyes. These are the explosions of attack helicopters that d d hit these cars. These, uh, many of them. I'm not saying all of them, but these are not just guys with guns. A guy with a gun does not flatten a car. It's impossible. And... Israel doesn't want people to know this. And so they're shredding and burying these cars. And somehow, luckily, a few photos got out. Uh, but this is uh, another story that your mainstream media will not cover at all. Uh, they just act like, oh, 1,200 people were killed on October 7th. Yeah, 1,200 were killed. Uh, but 
many of those were killed by the IDF. We'll never know the actual proportion that were killed by the IDF. It seems like a lot. Uh, let's continue for a moment from uh, the Al Jazeera report with the video from the IDF. I don't know if the video got leaked from the IDF or it's possible the IDF is actually putting out the video to say, look at all the wonderful work we did on uh, on October 7th. But either way, now my concern is with this footage, we cannot tell whether they're Hamas gunmen or civilians or possibly hostages. And I don't believe the helicopter pilot or the machine gun operator would be able to tell either. These big rounds have a certain area of effect and obviously come at a certain rate that if you shoot at a group of people you're most likely going to kill everyone you are knowingly putting your own civilians at risk the i unit compiled it knowingly key word there now the idf in israel is trying to really play up the oh the chaos of the moment we a lot of chaos going on but even in the chaos of the moment if you know that hamas militants have come into israel and are taking people kidnapping people you don't just blow up every car you see unless you want to kill the hostages, which was is was Israel's goal. The detailed list of those killed on October 7, it found that 27 captives died somewhere between their homes and the Gaza fence. So he's saying that on the list of those who have been killed, tw at least 27 were, were killed on the way back to Gaza, meaning they had been caught uh, as hostages and they were being brought back to Gaza and then they're obliterated from these helicopters uh, mainly in the sky, maybe tanks as well, but mainly helicopters. Um, and something else you should know about those numbers of, oh, this many captives died uh, or were killed near the Gaza fence on the way to the Gaza fence, et cetera, is that some have pointed out that several of those on that list were uh, uh, under, undercover, plainclothes or whatever, military, uh, military intelligence, Etc. So when we hear 1,200 Israelis uh, civilians, or, or no, 1,200 Israelis, they don't say civilians because many of them were IDF. Some of them were IDF in uniform. Some of them, many of them were IDF not in uniform. Uh, many of them were IDF veterans. But anyway, they so they don't say civilians. They say 1,200 Israelis were killed uh, October 7th and 8th. Um, but we're we're learning that and then they sometimes will say of those this many were civilians 600 700 but we're learning that many of that 600 700 whatever the number is that were supposedly civilians not all of them all are actually civilians uh pe people who have really dug into the names and who they are have been uh pointing that out thank you so much Lee 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 for the donation. You rock and you're keeping this show going. And thank you. I have fought against censorship and suppression for so long, you know, many years now. It's been two years since my TV show was uh, canceled by U.S. sanctions and my YouTube with a quarter million subscribers banned around the world. Uh, but, you know, I keep fighting. And thanks to you, you guys make it possible for me to keep fighting to get this information out there. And the YouTube, the new YouTube page is up to 65,000. I hope you guys will hit subscribe and maybe we can get up to 70,000 here soon. Uh, you're, again, you're making this show possible for me to keep doing this. I live stream four days a week. So I hope you will just show up because you're probably not going to get the alerts. You're probably just going to have to show up. Uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, noon Pacific, but obviously you can watch it afterwards as well. Uh, so I want to keep going about some of these revelations, various things we've been learning about what's been going on with this massacre, with this genocide by Israel. There was massive protests against uh, the, to block the Oscars, which, you know, I understand that because there are it, it is a lot of kind of uh, 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 spectacle. A spectacle in the middle of a genocide it feels painful, feels awful. And so I understand the desire to protest uh, that ridiculous spectacle of uh, wealth and privilege in a time of genocide. Um, but anyway, there there were there are some actors who are have actually worked hard to speak out about this, like Mark Ruffalo and uh, who stand for the cause. But many protesters blocked uh, a lot of the entry to the Oscars. Anyway, this video is of Khan Yunus, which is the town in Gaza that at first, after October 7th, uh, Gazans were told to flee to this town, to the town you're seeing on your screen that has now been completely destroyed. Uh, this is some footage of just how destroyed it is. 
This is where they were told to flee to. This was supposed to be one of the safe areas for people to go to. And now you see how utterly obliterated it is because Israel's goal, the Israeli government at least, their goal is to kill as many as possible. And so they told people to flee here and then they attacked it and blew it up. And they have then been saying they are going to attack Rafa. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, and there are something like two, close to 2 million people in Rafa now. There's only 2.3 million in all of Gaza before October 7th. So most people in Gaza have crowded into Rafa in order to be somewhat safe and yet now Israel is talking about invading and uh, attacking Rafa like they did Khan Yunus, as you're seeing in this footage. It's amazing, seriously, that there are still journalists, brave journalists that are there in Gaza, that go to Gaza, that uh, continue to operate from Gaza, even as so many of their colleagues have been murdered during this genocidal operation, uh, really is incredibly brave of them. and. And uh, actually, I'm going to get into how those of us speaking the truth about about what's been going on uh, are censored in another way. Now, obviously, I luckily am not facing assassination, which is what Israel does to journalists in Gaza. They have killed over well over 100 uh, journalists, which is more journalists than killed were killed during the entire Vietnam War, more journalists than were killed during the entirety of World War II. Uh, because Israel is targeting journalists, whereas journalists were not targeted during those other wars, uh, largely for the most part. Anyway, I brought to you the many times the the uh, story of Un Unwa or Unwa. I don't. I can't say like if you're going to say Unwa or Unra, I can't. I can't say the RW. I don't know. Are there people out there that can do it? If there's people out there, then more power to you. Okay, you're a stronger human than I. I just can't Unra. I can't do it. So I got. I got to leave out the R and just say Unwa. Or I could leave out the W and say Unra. But Unra sounds like you're anti sun god, and you know I don't want to be anti sun god. I don't want to be Unra. Uh, so I'll go with Unwa. Uh, the UNRWA. Uh, I brought to, I brought you this story about how, you know, we were told that 12 members of this UN agency, this massive UN agency with 30,000 employees were involved in October 7th. We were told 12. Israel was saying 12 of their employees were involved in October 7th. It helped get Un UNWA defunded by so many countries uh, immediately, even though Israel brought forward no proof. Well, now we hear from UNWA the, their report that Israel, quote unquote, coerced some of the agency employees to falsely admit Hamas links. And what I, this is a question for, for, for those of you out there, for those of you in the comments, what do you think the word co coerced means in this Reuters headline? What do you think they mean by coerced? Ah, uh, torture, straight up torture. So we learned these people were tortured in order to say that their colleagues were involved in October uh, 7th. And that garbage was then used by the US and much of the uh, U, uh, much of the EU to defund, and Canada, to defund this massive aid agency, which is the largest aid agency in all of Palestine, and you know amounts to not over 9 million hospital and, and medical visits a year, has over 700 schools that they operate. Uh, obviously gives food and medicine and everything else. But now we know that they tortured, Israel tortured the UN employees. I mean, how is that not a massive story? I don't mean one Reuters article. I mean, headlines, banners everywhere, all over CNN. Israel is torturing UN employees. How is that not everywhere? It's bananas. I mean, they've also murdered UN employees, so there's that too. The UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees said some employees released into Gaza from Israeli detention reported having been pressured, quote unquote, by Israeli authorities into falsely stating that the agency has Hamas links and that staff took part in the October 7th attacks. The assertions are contained in a report by the UN Relief Agency, UNWA, or UNRWA, if you hate sun gods, reviewed by Reuters and dated February 2024, which detailed allegations of mistreatment in Israeli detention. 
Abuse they said they had experienced included, wait for it, severe physical beatings, waterboarding, and threats to harm their family members. I, like, how is this, how is not even the UN talking about this? And I don't just mean UNWA. How is, like, this not, I mean, maybe it will be eventually, but how is this not a major meeting at the UN right now? Uh, so, folks, uh, Israel is torturing and murdering our employees do we do we care about that should we say anything about that should we because the head of the un is not doing anything about this genocide they i mean obviously the u.s is the one that keeps vetoing the the security council votes but they're not doing anything about this genocide and here you have more evidence that israel is not only murdering un employees but torturing them torturing them and some of the uh, countries that had d ended their funding of this aid agency, massive agency. They're, and by the way, their budget is over a billion dollars a year. Massive aid agency. And they uh, their funding was getting cut left and right. But now some countries are re-upping, coming back after there's been no evidence of this supposed link to Hamas. Sweden and Canada resume funding UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. So at least Sweden and Canada are back in funding UNWA. Other countries like Spain have increased their funding to try to make up for uh, the decrease from other countries. And I, I brought to you previously that Israel has been trying to crush UNWA for years. And the reason, one of the key reasons that they have to uh, work so hard to crush UNWA is because just the existence of this aid agency means that the Palestinians are refugees. And guess what? If you're a refugee, that means, if you're defined as a refugee, that means you have a home somewhere else. And where were those homes? I'll let you take a guess on that one. Where were the homes that these Palestinians are refugees from? Well, they're in Israel. So Israel does not want to acknowledge that, refu that, that Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank, et cetera, are refugees. And if you have a refugee aid agency, it's in the name, it's in the name, it's in the name that these are refugees, then it acknowledges, not only does it give medical visits and all these things that Israel doesn't want them to have, but it acknowledges that these are refugees that have a home somewhere else. And Israel does not, it cannot handle that acknowledgement. Uh, speaking of Spain, Spain's actually been pretty good on a lot of this, uh, one of the better countries on what's been going on here. Uh, with this ongoing genocide operation, Israel's special genocide operation. Spain's prime minister says he will propose that parliament recognizes a Palestinian state. So there is Spain saying that they are making moves to try and recognize a Palestinian state. And something about, there's a reason that, you, that the U.S. and Israel, even though they claim, oh, two-state solution, two-state solution, right? You hear a bunch of that. They never want, Israel will not allow a two-state solution. They view a two-state solution as, uh, you know, uh, absolutely a non-starter, even though they pretend that they, some of them will pretend they want it. And the reason is this. If Palestine were to become a legitimate state of their own, guess what? All of a sudden, they have a lot more rights under international law. They have the right to come and leave their country which Gaza's an open-air prison. They're not allowed to leave, not without Israel's permission, which Israel doesn't give permission to most of them. So Gazans would immediately be allowed as one of the rights of a country is... Now, there are many people in countries who are not allowed to leave, but that's because their own country, meaning their own dictator or whatever, stopped them, not because other countries stopped them. Uh, Israel stopping Gazans from leaving goes against international law goes against UN, goes against all the rules of what a nation is. You can't stop another country from leaving. Another thing that a country is allowed to have, uh-oh, is a military. So all of a sudden, Palestinians would be entitled to have their own military and build it up as they see fit. Uh, now, you know, maybe there's, obviously there's, there's other considerations around nuclear bombs, although Israel has nuclear bombs and pretends they don't. So there you go. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, 11th hour, says Lee for President 2024, Vice President Garden Rock. Thank you. I appreciate that.
uh, that he, he or she is referring to the yard, the, the rock from from the ground that I that I found that I am running for president. Uh, Yardrock2024.com if you want to learn about what Yard Rock stands for. He is, he's a, of, of, of rocks and inanimate objects that I've found, best one I've seen for president. Absolutely. Um, and now that we're down to Biden and Trump, I mean, for God's sakes, do we really have to talk about those two lunatics for, oh, it's just so disgusting. We got to talk about them for months more? Jeez. Two absolutely cognitively destroyed human beings. We got to sit here and a debate as to who was going to do better as a president. I mean, luckily, the largely the president is just a theater piece. So, you know, it's like, a, it's like a prop at the back of the stage. You know, when you see like a high school play and there's like a kid dressed as a tree, that's what our president is for the most part, for the most part, not, not 100%, but for the most part. Speaking of props and theater, let's get to... The U.S. military, and we've mentioned this, obviously, because it's been the talk of this has been going on for a week, but this is a New York Times, a U.S. military ship, a U.S. military ship has set sail to help build a pier off Gaza for aid. Uh, they're, 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 and we've made fun of the pier already, so I'm not, I'm not acting like this is breaking news. What's breaking news is that the ship has finally set sail to go build this pier. It's happening, folks. We're building a pier. Because we wanted to appear that we're doing a goddamn thing. That's right. That's a pun. It was there just for you. It's just for you, folks. And I believe I'm the first to come up with it. Uh, no, I haven't heard anybody else say it, but that doesn't mean others haven't. Hey, thank you, Jokers for You. Donated uh, five bucks on Rumble and says humanity needs real revolutionaries to storm the Capitol and stop this genocide ASAP. Thank you, Jokers for You, for keeping this show going. Uh, here's the New York Times. The U.S. military said on Sunday that a ship had set sail carrying equipment to build a floating pier on Gaza's coast, part of a Biden administration effort to deliver aid to the enclave by sea and help ease its hunger crisis. Now, when they announced this, that they were going to build a pier, that they wanted to build a pier, that they wanted it to appear, that they were doing anything, I went through the 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 analysis of like, why did they pick a pier? Like, yeah, that's one way to deliver food, but obviously there's all these b b crossings along the between, between Israel and Gaza, between Egypt and Gaza. There are plenty of crossings to get aid to Gaza. Why build a pier? Uh, also, they've been airdropping some, although apparently that's a minuscule amount. Also, those airdrops have been killing people. I'm not kidding. Those airdrops have been landing on people and killing them. So we're even killing people with our aid. But I was wondering why pick a pier? It just seems so bizarre. To like, oh no, we can't use any of those crossings, even the one from Egypt to give, even though Egypt's been fine with allowing aid through, it's been Israel that's been stopping the aid. So why use a goddamn pier? And and many people have been pointing out that there's a lot of oil. Uh, uh, they found oil off of Gaza and, and Israel obviously wants that oil, so does the US. But I don't actually think, like they can build oil piers, they can go dig the oil, they can do that without this ridiculous show of a pier. It just seems to me like it doesn't actually matter that much in terms of getting the oil. And I think this, this is my analysis is they want something that appears Joe Biden's doing something right. It looks like Joe Biden because he's Joe Biden's running for president. He wants it to look like he gives a shit, even though he does. And even though he's facilitated this genocide, even though he's quote unquote supported Israel forever, even though Joe Biden is the number one recipient of money from the Israel lobby over the course of his entire career. Number one, uh, so they want it to look like he's doing something, but if but if that were to open the the let's say uh, Egypt crossing into Gaza and just deliver all just like a thousand trucks, which are waiting by the way, there are a thousand trucks just waiting to get in, just a thousand trucks waiting to get like if he were to do that, Israel doesn't want that, right? They wouldn't allow that. They don't want aid to get in. They want people to die of starvation, of medical problems. They want people to die as much as possible. I've said many times that Israel wants as many people to die from disease as from bombs. So they're trying to kill as many as possible. And so Israel does not want all of that aid to get in. And I think that the reason they came up with this peer idea was to give basically a month. I mean, it's going to take like a month to build this thing before anything gets in. 
and the, the ship just set, set sail for God's sake. It's got to go across the Atlantic Ocean from the United States. The dumbest crap I've ever heard. I think it's to give this month window where the U.S. is building this pier and Israel can continue their genocide while Joe Biden appears to be doing something. Sorry to use the pun again, but looks like he's doing something. And to me, that's the only reason I can come up because the the oil, it's like, yeah, there's oil, but they can get the oil other way. The pier just, I think it's just to, to buy time. It's a month window that Israel can continue genociding and Biden can say, oh, I'm not, I'm not uh, genociding. Uh, by the way, for those asking how to donate in the Super Chaps, you've got to click on either YouTube or Rumble. you got to click like the dollar sign or something in order to do a Super Chat, I believe. Uh, maybe others in the chat can uh, help people. Alex says, here's a win-win. Palestine joins NATO. This requires they use uh, U.S. military industrial complex weapons and arms and protects trade routes. Stay witty, Lee. Thank you so much, Alex for the donation you guys again keep this show rolling and funded because i am heavily suppressed and censored for what i'm doing actually i'm gonna get to my to my censorship on tiktok which i that happened two months ago so it's not news but there is a leaked audio recording of about i think why tiktok has has banned my account and so many others uh, and of course, it's connected to Israel. On Sunday, the U.S. military said that an army ship, the General Besson, has set sail from a base near Norfolk, Virginia a day earlier. It was unclear when it would reach Gaza. Besson, a logistics support vessel, is carrying the first equipment to establish a temporary pier to deliver vital humanitarian supplies. If they're vital, don't go build a goddamn pier. If they're vital, just open the... just. There are so many ways that the U.S. could make Israel open the gates between Gaza and Egypt uh, at minimum. It, it, if the U.S. were to stop funding and stop sending bombs, Israel, the U.S. has sent over 100 shipments of bombs to Israel to rain down on children just since October 7th. And that doesn't count all of the bombs that we gave Israel before October 7th. So... You could, the Biden and the Biden administration and our Congress and all these goons, all these parasites, all these vampires, all these snakes, all these pieces of human garbage could tell Israel, we're not sending any more bombs, we're not sending any more aid, and we don't have your back against Hezbollah, and they could make them open all these gates and stop the genocide. But they're not. They're not. Because that is not their goal. Thank you so much to the tens of thousands of you watching around the world for, uh, for supporting the show and making it possible. I want to get something. This is a clip from Norman Finkelstein, who has been so good on this topic for years and years. And by the way, speaking of suppressed and censored, he's lost his tenure for standing up against Israeli apartheid over the years. He has been uh, attacked and chased uh, and it, it impacts people's career in a very large way. Um, let's see. Did I get to, all of the no, I don't think Scotch donated on Rumble and said, "Let's not forget that our elite class is responsible for the Zionist agenda. We have to kill this concept of an elite class of people." Yes, classism absolutely is responsible. And uh, if in case you need a reminder, Zionism does not mean Judaism. Okay, folks, for any of you confused out there, I'm Jewish and I'm anti-Zionist because I'm anti-apartheid and for equality, and I'm anti-genocide. And uh, you can be Jewish and anti-genocide. It's it's funny how that works, as I've said many times. Okay, here is Norm Finkelstein, and then in a few minutes I'll get to that the the leaked audio recording uh, relating to Israel's game plan, propaganda-wise, and what's going on there. President Biden has turned the Gaza genocide into a photo op for himself. Ursula von der Leyen, who's one of the key supporters of the genocide, is now trying to clear her name. She's a bona fide war criminal. It's not for no reason that Claire Daly in the European Parliament calls her Frau Genocide, or as I prefer to call her, the Nazi princess. Now let's get down to the facts. There's no problem with getting food and medicine 
to the periphery of Gaza. There are hundreds of trucks which are ready to go in. It doesn't change anything one whit if there is a floating pier on the water periphery of Gaza. That's not the problem. The problem is getting the food and the medicine from the periphery to the people. And Israel is blocking that. It's blocking it both physically and also by its continued indiscriminate bombing to terrorize the civilian population. There's something truly sickening when the president of the United States turns the martyrdom of the people of Gaza into an election year photo op. He's trying to recreate the Berlin airlift of 1948 yeah, well put. It really is a photo op. I mean, that's what we're seeing with this whole peer ridiculousness. Uh, even apparently the, the the Pentagon and the Biden administration, not Biden himself, but the Biden administration, uh, some of the anonymous people uh, not wanting to lend their name to the quote, but have said that this peer won't, it couldn't even begin to be, in, uh, to be functioning for a month or more. Like these people are dying now. And Biden has come up with a solution that won't get them anything for a month at least. And of course, at any moment, Israel could just bomb the pier. If they ever were to decide they feel like it, they'll bomb the pier. It's, it's so remarkably stupid, and it is just a photo op. Okay, let's get to this uh, uh, leaked phone call, uh, meeting call, from the head of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation Defamation League, Um about the propaganda, and it tells so much about why we're hearing the the angles of propaganda you're hearing out of Israel and out of the Western media that supports the Israeli regime, the Israeli genocide. We are hearing certain types of talking points out of them, and I'm and so actually I forgot I have a leaked phone call and uh, leaked slides from a presentation. All of this is about how the propaganda is being angled. Uh, coming out of Israel, which then gets parroted by our mainstream media, so much of our mainstream media just spitting this garbage out. So here is, first we'll start with the leaked phone call from the head of the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL. The ADL is, it, it, it's a Israeli propaganda outlet, although because they just call it the Anti-Defamation League, a lot of people think that it's just a, you know, uh, completely unbiased, trying to stop anti-Semitism but it's not unbiased at all. It's completely pro-Israel, even during a genocide, as Israel does does this horror show. As Israel kills, I haven't even given the numbers yet on this hour. As Israel has killed over 31,000 people, but that does not count the people missing in the rubble. So really, it's over 40,000 people, 70% of them women and children. And ADL, Anti-Defamation League, still right there with them. Uh, here they are, the, the leaked phone call from the head of the ADL. But I also want to point out that we have a major, major, major generational problem. All the polling I've seen, ADL's polling, ICC's polling, independent polling, suggests this is not a left-right gap, folks. The issue in the United States in support for Israel is not left and right. It is young and old. And the numbers of young people who think that Hamas's, you know, massacre was justified is shockingly. And uh, I'll keep playing, but I, uh, I just want to say there he's using the propaganda that oh, young people support Hamas's massacre, which is not what the polling says at all. What young people? Uh, I don't know what age he's talking about, but what young people have said they support in a big way is free Palestine and the genocide allow these people to be free, to have their own state, to, uh, to, to no longer be living in a prison, uh, to, to make Israel not an apartheid regime of uh, destruction and abuse. That's what young people are saying. He calls it supporting Hamas's massacre, because if you're putting out this kind of propaganda and working in this way, that's how you phrase things. And so that's how he's phrasing it, even in private. And so we really have a TikTok problem a Gen Z problem that our community needs to put the same brains that gave us Tagli, the same brains that 
Marines that gave us all these other amazing innovations need to put our energy towards this. So he's saying we young people are not buying that this genocide is okay. Uh, young people think that Palestinians should have their freedom, think that Palestinians should be allowed to have life and liberty. And that's a major problem. And so we need to get our smart brains, you know, all these people who've come up with the propaganda we've used in the past, we need to get them to uh, tackle this fact that he calls it a TikTok problem. Well, that may be one of the reasons that I was banned from TikTok, even though I barely started using it. I've been using it for two months and I'd started to actually do pretty well. Uh, a few of my videos got over 100,000 views and I was putting out daily videos on TikTok. I hadn't used it till just, again, uh, starting in like October, around the same time Israel started their genocide. I mean, their ramped up genocide. And and then my account was banned in uh, end of end of December, uh, right before Christmas. And it was banned. Here's the thing: is most people who are banned on TikTok, it says uh, it gives you the option. You get one little screen. It gives you the option to appeal. And I didn't have that option. Other people have shown me photos of theirs, and it said appeal. I had no appeal option. I was just banned. And it said for community guideline strikes that it wouldn't tell me what they were. And it's because I was talking about Gaza. It's because I was talking about Israel. And clearly. Uh, that this was something that people had successfully pressured TikTok to just ban people who were speaking the truth about what's going on in Gaza. Fast, because again, like we've been chasing this left-right divide. It's the wrong game. The real game is the next generation and the Hamas and their accomplices, the, idi the useful idiots in the West, are falling in line in ways that are terrified. Glasgow, I'll just say. Useful idiots. That, that's what we're called. If you speak the truth about this, about Russiagate, about the Ukraine proxy war, if you speak the truth about that stuff, you're quote unquote a useful idiot because you dared tell the truth. We saw a dramatic change in the language of the activists here in America on October the 8th. The language of groups that we've long tracked have long been problematic like Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voices for Peace. By the way, the two groups he listed are two of the most based groups, Students for Justice in Palestine, and I mean, I have, I have less connection to them, but Jewish Voices for Peace, I've been to some of their events and stuff. Jewish Voices for Peace, I get their emails. Jewish Voices for Peace, amazing, doing amazing work. Like, And by the way, you don't have to be Jewish to support them, so you should support them. But they have been doing awesome work, protesting, getting out there, showing that, Oh my God, Jews are against genocide? What? Yes, we are. Uh, some of us. And anyway, doing great work. So he despises them. And anyway, he's he's saying, we have infiltrators in these groups. That's not a shock. It's like all these groups have infiltrators because anyone can join. So of course there's going to be infiltrators. It flipped like this and went to like Iranian propaganda. <laughs> so he calls telling the truth about this genocide Iranian propaganda. The language I could show you from their toolkits, because our analysts are in their groups. We saw this again on our... He just said our analysts are in their groups. So in case, this is another admission from this leaked phone call, is these groups have been infiltrated to some level. That doesn't mean they're captured. Uh, like I said, Jewish Voice for Peace does awesome work. So they're not captured, but he's just admitted, the head of the ADL, has admitted we have infiltrated these groups. Uh, I don't know if that's a big breaking news. Everyone should assume that these scumbags like ADL have have infiltrated any group that they don't like. But over the eighth, it was that fast. Like the language in their toolkits was all about the Zionist entity and lots of other language that we recognized from Iranian propaganda. Basically, if you use the term Zionist in, in a negative way, as opposed to a wonderful way, then you're Iranian propaganda. You know, it couldn't possibly be that you just don't like apartheid states and you just don't like uh, forced refugee status for millions. And you just don't like people forced to live in uh, open air prison and you just don't like uh, people being genocided. It couldn't be any of that. Couldn't be that you that you that you don't love ethnic cleansing. No, couldn't be that. It must just be that Iran got their tentacles into you, 
and uh, was able to force you to say these things, to force you, trick you into being anti-genocide. Iran somehow fooled me into being anti-genocide. I don't know what happened. So here is one of the tactics they're using to deal with their quote-unquote TikTok problem. Israel, and this is from CNBC, so this is, again, a propaganda outlet, but they're telling the truth about this. Israel and Jewish schools reportedly urge parents to tell their kids to delete Instagram and TikTok, but then the reason is the propaganda. Why are they deleting it? Not because it, not because Israel has a TikTok problem, but because of disturbing images of hostages, right? That's right. Don't let the young people learn about what's actually going on in Gaza right now because that's bad for us. So let's tell everyone that they need to delete their Instagram and TikTok. That's the solution. Just make sure they don't have the information about what's going on there. Several Israeli and Jewish schools are reportedly urging parents to delete social media apps like Instagram, TikTok, and X, formerly known as Twitter, from their children's smartphones to prevent them from seeing violent images. Now, there's a fine discussion about whether kids should be see violent images, but that is not why Israel's is trying to get people to delete these apps. That is absolutely not the reason. We cannot allow our kids to watch this stuff. It's also, yeah, you, and, and by the way, which do you, everybody, you, you're on the, you're on the apps. You've seen the social media thingamajiggers, right? Which do you see more of? The image, horrible images of, uh, of Israeli hostages or horrible images of Gazan children being massacred, starving to death, having their parents killed, parents losing their children. Which do you see more? That or the Israeli hostages? I think you see a lot more of the people suffering in Gaza largely because there are a lot more people suffering in Gaza. There are scant few images and video of Israeli hostages, but there are endless streams of the horror show that is the genocide Israel's is perpetrating. So big difference there. And, and that is why Israel wants these apps deleted. And again, despite me being deleted from TikTok, uh, despite my main YouTube channel being banned around the world, the information, you know, and I was just giving myself as an example, but the information is still getting out there. I mean, could you imagine if these platforms were actually free? Like if my TV show still existed, if my YouTube still existed, if my TikTok still existed, if my Facebook wasn't suppressed into oblivion. If these, and, and again, just using myself as an example, but take me and multiply it by, you know, 10,000 of us who are suppressed or deleted out there. Uh, can you imagine what the sentiment would be around the world right now? If we still had actual legitimate freedom of thought and message on these platforms. Okay, so I want to get to another leak that is related of the messaging, the propaganda being put out by Israel and the the angle you're hearing it, how, how it's coming to you, why certain things are being talked about over others. Uh, the Gray Zone has obtained a leaked presentation from and to the Israel lobby. Israel lobby is a general term that means all these uh, lobbying firms that are pro-Israel, which which really should have to register as foreign agents because they're lobbying for a foreign government. But apparently only Israeli lobby groups don't have to register as foreign agents. All the other ones do. So this presentation that was leaked was presented by Frank Luntz. Now, Frank Luntz, I've been, you know, known, I've known about his stuff for years and years. He used to be a just straight up Republican uh, pollster, uh, messaging person, messaging guru. And he would tell Republicans how to phrase things so that people didn't know how gut-wrenchingly horrific the Republicans are. He would say, you know, don't say this word. Say, don't say we're going to uh, rape your lives. Instead, say uh, we want to help you be free. You know, he would say those kind of things. He then had some sort of crisis of, uh, of, 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 I don't know, ethics or morality or whatever. And he decided to start revealing the tricks. So he occasionally, he, he, he's far less prevalent now than he was uh, 15 years ago, but he started telling how they do the tricks, how they do the talking points to some degree. He didn't become uh, an awesome guy or anything. He just revealed some of the, the, the way that the propaganda, the manipulation is done. However, and I didn't know this until now, 
still, despite his, uh, his, his change of heart there, still massively pro-Israel, all right? So still loves Israel and wants to help them in every way possible. Loves, loves, loves genocide, big genocide supporter. Anyway, so this presentation was by him telling Israeli groups and Israeli lobby groups how to manipulate us, you and me, America in general. Coming from the gray zone, leaked Israel lobby presentation urges U.S. officials to justify war on Gaza with Hamas rape claims. The gray zone has obtained slides from, the comp from a confidential Israel lobby presentation based on data from Republican pollster Frank Luntz. They contain talking points for politicians and public figures seeking to justify Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip. Two prominent pro-Israel lobby groups are, were holding private meetings in New York City to coach elected officials, so U.S. elected officials, and well-known figures on how to influence public opinion in favor of Israel's genocide. How do we trick people into thinking genocide ain't so bad? How do we do that? These PR sessions convened by the UJA Federation and Jewish Community Relations Council rely on data collected by Frank Luntz. Uh, the Luntz tested presentations on the war in Gaza urge politicians to avoid trumpeting America's, America's supposedly shared democratic values with Israel. Don't worry about that, right? Israel, the U.S. used to do that a lot. They'd say, oh, well, Israel's the number one or the only democracy in the Middle East, blah, blah, blah. Israel's not a democracy. If you've got uh, 5 million people in refugee camps and 2.3 million in an open-air prison that can't vote and have no say in your government, that's not a democracy, my friends. Sorry, that's an apartheid state in which a large percentage of your population have no say in the government. That ain't no democracy. Um, he said they should focus on the language of war with Hamas. That's not surprising, right? Don't call it, don't call it a, a, a war on, with Gaza. Call it a, don't call it a conflict with Palestinians. Call it a war with Hamas. Even as clearly 70% of those Israel's murdering are women and children. Many of the last remaining 30% are innocent men. Uh, and so, but still, don't don't talk about any of that. Just call it a war with Hamas. But here's the most interesting part to me, and and horrific and cynical. By the way, this is a photo of Frank Luntz with the IDF uh, after October seventh. So this is not an old photo. He he did Thanksgiving over with the IDF. F. He said, "I was blessed to be invited to join sixty of the most heroic people I've ever met." He said, they taught me the meaning of selfless service. Isn't it great to be selfless while you're committing genocide? Wow, observating, kicking ass this today. Uh, thank you for the donation. Owed you a few. Galloway getting strong, strength to the righteous. And yes, I do, by the way, uh, thank you so much, observating. It's amazing that you're doing these donations. Uh, folks, you can also donate on Venmo at Lee Camp, just throwing that out there. But uh I, I have asked uh, my my buddy, George Galloway, to come on the show sometime, but he is so busy that I don't know that it's going to be happening soon. Uh, but anyway, just just throwing it out there that I have a, a, a interview request out to George Galloway. But this is the part I found most most shocking, most cynical, and most horrific about this leaked presentation that they did not, very much did not want you to know about. This is the polling they did. And they're presenting this to, uh, you know, important people, uh, politicians, et cetera. And they're showing you what people, it, it, the question that they polled was, which bothers you more? That Hamas, and then they fill in the blank. And the top of the chart, for those of you listening to the podcast, the top of the chart says rape civilians. The bottom of the chart says kidnap civilians. In the middle, you have massacred civilians, slaughtered civilians, butchered civilians, murdered civilians, executed, brutalized civilians exterminated civilians. Basically, what should we be talking about the most? And by far the winner is raped civilians. That is the most upsetting to people, apparently, uh, according to this polling. And, you know, you can get into long discussions as to why that is, why people are more horrified to hear about one thing than another, uh, you know, why they're more horrified to hear the word slaughter than to hear the word killed, etc. But the point is that they have found that saying Hamas rape civilians is just so much more impactful, so much more important to their cause, to their propaganda, that that's what should be pushed. Even, 
at the expense of truth. We have, I have brought to you day after day the fact that these reports, the UN report internally, if you actually look at what it says, the UN report on Hamas sexual violence says they couldn't find a single victim, says they re- the, the, for the allegations they relied on, uh, on just Israeli state outlets to tell them what had happened. Uh, that's the UN report. The New York Times article about Hamas systemic sexual violence has been completely debunked. Even one of the main authors said in a podcast she couldn't find a single victim and she couldn't find uh, actual evidence. Like, it's been completely debunked. And again, I've said many times that we, that you don't know something wouldn't come out later, but that evidence is not there right now. And yet here is Frank Luntz and others telling these people, uh, you know, politicians, et cetera, to just keep highlighting the not true thing. Just keep highlighting systemic sexual violence, system, sorry, systematic sexual violence, uh, rather than that Hamas killed civilians or et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, again, there's, there's a fine discussion or argument psychologically as to why people are more horrified by that. I think that one of the big things might be uh, and they should be horrified by rape, but they should also be horrified by killing. You should be horrified by both. But I think one of the big, maybe the big psychological reasons in our subconscious is that we go our whole lives uh, hearing justification for certain kinds of killing, right? We hear we hear that the U.S. military is just and that they should go kill. We watch movies and James Bond has bad guys he needs to kill. And all the, all the shows you see, all the cop shows, certain killing is good. You don't usually almost ever see any kind of cultural, like, here's why sexual violence is good. So we've been crafted our whole lives to think certain kinds of killing are good or acceptable. And it's not true for the most part, almost exclusively for rape or sexual violence. That does not mean it doesn't go on in a horrific level, but we're not told to endorse certain kinds of it. Whereas certain kinds of killing We absolutely go our whole lives being told to endorse certain kinds of killing. Um, Okay, let's get to, uh, this is, I'm going to play a clip from MSNBC from Al Sharpton. Good old Al. Boy, no one has done less for the people of this country than Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton, he's been around for, I didn't even know he still had a show on MSNBC. Uh, but I'm going to show a clip of him talking to the former Israeli uh, prime minister and break down all of the horrific propaganda that's coming from them. Uh, but anyway, I also want to pause for a second to say, please make sure to hit subscribe, hit the bell icon. Even if you're already subscribed, do me this favor. Click subscribe again and see what, if you're on YouTube, see what level of bell you're on. Because you've got to move it to, I think, all Because naturally, if you just click the bell, it'll put it on sometimes. So you have to move it to all to find out about my videos. But that being said, uh, whether you hit subscribe or not, please just show up. I do these live streams four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. um, And I'm going to be here. So you may not get the alerts because I'm heavily suppressed. Uh, Many of my videos are, are suppressed in one form or another. So just show up. Just join me. Uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. You can always watch afterwards. You know, tens of thousands of people I know watch afterwards. But if you want to join it live, that's the way to do it. And uh, yeah, so just show up. Just uh, I'll see you there. And then on Wednesdays, my my day off of these live streams, I do another live stream called Government Secrets. Uh, you can see on YouTube or rumble.com slash Lee Camp. But okay, let's get to the former Israeli prime minister. And all of this horrific propaganda. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, sorry, this is a short story. Before I do that, I wanted to bring to you this story about Daniel Hale uh, uh, getting free. Um, I I kept meaning to cover this. It's been several days since this happened, but I just, uh, there's so much going on with Israel's special genocide operation that I keep missing other stories. But anyway, uh, from Kevin Gustola, drone whistleblower subjected to harsh confinement finally released from prison. Uh, Daniel Hale has finally been released. He was the one who told us so much about about the U.S. drone operation, how many it kills, etc. 
and he's finally out of prison. Drone whistleblower Daniel Hale was released from prison in February after spending 33 months in some of the harshest confinement conditions ever imposed on a person for disclosing classified information to the press. Hale remains in federal custody, but is living in home confinement until January. Though President Donald Trump's Justice Department indicted Hale, his case became the first major espionage act convicted sorry, conviction secured by prosecutors under President Joe Biden. So yet again, you tell the truth about the U.S. empire and all the murder and, 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 and uh, all, all the murder, all the murdering and, and obliteration that we do around the world, all the harm we do around the world. If you reveal the truth about it, you will go to jail. If, if you have access to classified information or they will make every ever effort to uh, to send you to jail. Someone's asking me to have Daniel Hale on. I have an interview request out to him as well. So we'll see if he's free to do an interview. But uh, some of the stuff that he revealed, uh, he was a signals intelligence analyst at the U.S. Air Force. He was de deployed to Afghanistan, stationed at Bagram Air Base, and Hale later worked as a contractor for a firm known as Lidos. His contracting job gave him access to documents on the U.S. military's drone program that he shared with journalist and Intercept co-founder Jeremy Scahill. He, he was even touring around with Jeremy Scahill, like publicly speaking with him. And, and I don't know if there was some reason he thought they wouldn't go after him. Uh, obviously, they shouldn't have gone after him because he's revealing information that you and I need to know. But that's not how the U.S. government works now, is it? Documents from the 2010s, which Hale revealed, brought attention to the sheer amount of civilian deaths caused by targeted, quote unquote, killing operations. For example, during a one month, sorry, one five month period of Operation Haymaker in Afghanistan, nearly 90 percent of the people killed in airstrikes were not intended targets. Ninety percent and not intended targets, let's be honest, means innocent civilians. Not intended targets is the military's internal way of not saying innocent civilians. Uh, this sh showed more than 40% of the people in the U.S. government's database of terrorism suspects had no recognized terrorist group affiliation. The document helped Muslim Americans clear their names and forced the government to remove them from the no-fly list. Uh, yeah. It is amazing. 90% are innocent civilians. And this is the man who let us know that, that that's what our so-called targeted killing is. 90% innocent civilians and yet put in jail for revealing that to us. But thank goodness he's out of jail now. And uh, hopefully he is rewarded for what he's brought to us uh, after spending so much time in prison. Okay. Let's get to Al Sharpton. Joining me now is the former prime minister of Israel, uh, Naftali Bennett. Uh, Mr. Bennett, I have repeatedly called for the release of the Israeli hostages for peaceful ceasefire. I want to be candid with you and for cautious negotiations to bring forward a two state solution. It and and so Al Sharpton's at least saying that he brings up in the interview several times of people dying in Gaza. But. You notice he says the release of the Israeli hostages. Again, why is no one calling for the release, at least none of these people, none of these mainstream media, calling for the release of the Palestinian hostages? There are like 10,000 Palestinian hostages in Israeli prisons, many of them women and children. And no, we only want Israeli hostages freed. We don't care. We didn't care about the 5,000 hostages Israel had before Israel had before October 7th. Why should we care about them now? So anyway. Is that still a realistic option to bring this terrible war and what's going on to Gaza to an end? It's not a war. It's a genocide. It's ethnic cleansing. There's no there's no battle going on. It's just Israel raising Gaza, just b blowing it up, it, turning it into a parking lot, as many of them have said they'd like to do. Well, Reverend, there was a ceasefire on October 7th and Hamas. No, there actually wasn't. That's another. So. You know, they, like I said, they do, do, as we saw from the leaked slides, they do polling of all the things they're supposed to say. One of the things that they've clearly been instructed to repeat over and over is there was a, a ceasefire before October 7th. No, there wasn't. You can't call it a ceasefire when 
A, you literally bomb every once in a while. You just bomb Gaza. You just kill a bunch of people. You kill journalists. You shoot people like uh, the journalist Abu Akhla. Like you, 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 you just, they, they call it mowing the grass, right? You just kill certain people in Gaza. That's not a ceasefire. But Israel claims that was a ceasefire. But it's also not a ceasefire when you control their water, so you're making everyone drink dirty water. You control their food, so they're all many of them are are hungry or starving. You control their medicine, so many of them are dying from preventable diseases. That sounds to me like a war. Yeah, you're not killing them with bullets. You're killing them in other ways. I mean, sometimes they kill them with bullets, but pre-October 7th, you're killing them in a bunch of different ways. That's not a ceasefire. There was no ceasefire October 6th or whatever. In an unprovoked fashion, went in and did the massacre. Uh, the only... Unprovoked. Unprovoked. Catch that? By the way, it sounds to me like all the evidence or much of the evidence we've seen is that Hamas broke into Israel to, yes, take hostages. And that doesn't mean I do endorse that. But that is different than the massacre that ensued. The massacre ensued because of the IDF, which I showed you video of at the beginning of this show outcome that'll be acceptable is full dismantling of the Hamas terror state next to us. Otherwise, they'll do it again and again. The only outcome is full dismantling of Hamas. But what does full dismantling of Hamas look like to Israel? Well, it looks like ethnic cleansing. It looks like murdering and removing essentially every Gaza. And the full release of all hostages. But while children and... And I love the idea. They've also been told to, to play up as if they care about the hostages. Israel does not care about the hostages. And in fact, many of the hostages' families are protesting Netanyahu in Israel. They have protests almost every day against Netanyahu and this far-right messianic cabal that runs the Israeli regime. There are protests against them by many family members of the hostages because the family members of the hostages know that they've been... Uh, that, that Netanyahu has no intention of getting the hostages back. He just wants to kill as many as possible. So. And women and innocent civilians are being killed while this goes on. Certainly the whole world, certainly I did, stood up when that happened on October 7th. But now we're talking about this happening in Gaza. You know. <laughs> he has to pause because there's, he has to decide how to pivot away from that because he can't actually answer that. What about all the people dying in Gaza? Um, uh, new topic. Let me shift to, did I mention rape? Yeah, they can't actually talk about it. I hear a lot from uh, Hamas themselves that they're surprised by the unproportional uh, response of Israel. And I ask. Unproportional is a lovely use of euphemism for genocide. Like it's not unproportional. Unproportional would be killing a bunch of uh, Hamas fighters that are not attacking you. And, oh, my God, they've killed all these Hamas fighters. They've killed 10,000 or 5,000. And, and it, meanwhile, only uh, 1,200 were killed on October 7th. Uh, that'd be disproportional. This is just genocide. I asked them, when you massacred uh, families, you burnt babies, you kidnapped kids. Uh, by the way, the burnt babies things has been debunked. Uh, there's no one's really come up with any evidence that shows that any of the people burned on October 7th were not burned by the IDF. Uh, yes, Hamas went in with guns, but they didn't just start build, burning down the buildings. You know why? Because they were in them. So all these burned bodies had a large percentage of Hamas, Hamas fighters in them because it was IDF tank rounds. And you have actual IDF tank gunners doing interviews. Uh, I played one of them weeks ago saying that they were told to fire on civilian infrastructure with civilians inside. That's how you end up with everybody burned. And you murdered people in their homes on October 7th. What sort of response did you expect from Israel? What did you think? Did you think? I also love that, uh, resp that, that response of his. Basically, Hamas, what did you expect? Which is, so basically, you're, think, about, think about that as a, as a response. Of, you're committing genocide. What did you expect? We were, of course, going to genocide you. Is that a just a, like, <laughs> like, you're totally committing genocide. Well, we, what did you expect us to do? Obviously, we're going to commit genocide. That is not a defense. That is a terrible defense. That's a, like, if a, a serial murderer were on trial in a courtroom and you were like, you killed all these people. And his response was like, your honor, what did you expect me to do? Oh, good point. What did we expect him to do? Clearly kill all these people.
think we just lay back and do nothing. And I want to remind everyone that, you know, in, in Pearl Harbor, for example, when the Japanese attacked and killed 2,906 Americans, uh, ex excuse me, 2,306 Americans, the war went on for four years. Uh, Three million Japanese were killed, of which a million were uh, citizens. So I love this. Thank you, Linda, for the donation. Really appreciate it. You rock. Thank you, Linda. Um, so he compares it to Pearl Harbor, but he 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 talks about how many Japanese. It's like it's like okay, a few things. First of all, there was a legitimate war between the U.S. and Japan after Pearl Harbor, right? It was actually military forces fighting each other. On top of that, ultimately there was the nuclear bombs drop, which many people have said correctly was a horror show and was not justified and was completely illegitimate. And if you actually go back and study the history and study the historical record, there was no reason the U.S. needed to kill hundreds of thousands of innocent people. And, and you know, in, in uh, Hiroshima, they killed, I don't remember what it was, few hundred, few thousand actual Japanese military. In Nagasaki, it was like 12. Like, it was a tiny number of actual military in Nagasaki that they just, they just murdered 100,000 innocent people. So he gives Pearl Harbor as an example of this being justified, but it wasn't justified. The, the, the atom bombs were not justified. Japan was done. They were already going to surrender. They, they through back channels, they'd said multiple times that they would surrender if they, if, if the U.S. just let them uh, keep the emperor's title. So they, because the emperor was like religious to them, had a, the emperor had his title, then they could, uh, then they would do a full surrender out outside of that. And the U S refused because the U S actually wanted to send a message to the Soviet union about the power of the nuclear bomb. And if you really study the history, that's what it was. So he uses Pearl Harbor and that is a terrible example to use. Someone's, Saying I'm muted again? Am I muted? Uh, I don't think I am. I'm going to keep going as if I'm not. Uh, as if the, as if there is a sound. Some people saying they can hear me? Not sure. And here, we've already killed 13,000 terrorists. And yes. I'm That's just a straight up lie. They have not killed 13,000 uh, Hamas fighters. Like it's just common sense. Hamas is in Hamas is in the uh, tunnels, and there the bombs Israel dropping. Most of them are not in the tunnels. They're not. They're not tunnel busting bombs. Most of them. Unfortunately, civilians are dying because Hamas uses them as human shields. But the, the human shields argument has been completely debunked. It's uh, th there's no more. Hamas within civilian populations as there is IDF within Israeli civilian populations, right? The IDF is, guess what, throughout Israel, because most countries have military throughout their country. Uh, it's no, there's no difference. As if, as if any military just sits in one little part of the country and they're like, if you'd like to bomb us, this is where you bomb, right here. We're all, the whole U.S. military is just in Poughkeepsie. That's it. It's just, they all just, we're all in Poughkeepsie. If you need to bomb us, we'll be sitting in Poughkeepsie. So first of all, that is not how that works at all. But on top of that, Hamas is the government of Gaza. It's not just the militants. It Everything that is governmental in Gaza is Hamas. So when they say, oh, Hamas is within the civilian population, that's like saying you're, you know, garbage, uh, the people that pick up your garbage or your city hall is amongst the civilian population. It's like, uh, yeah, I'd say the city hall is amongst the civilian population. What did they expect? But the people that are being killed are not members of Hamas. And the people, many of them can't even get humanitarian aid. And I think that the whole world, or much of the world was on the side of Israel October 7th. But as this goes on, world opinion is saying two wrongs don't make a right. And, and clearly there's concern about what's going on in Gaza. The president of the United States, you has just announced a plan to help build a temporary pier on the Gaza coast in order to increase the flow of humanitarian aid to allow more shipments. By the way, 
So this is classic uh, MSNBC, Al Sharpton bullshit propaganda. They're acting like the peer's a big deal. I already told you how it's the stupidest thing in the world. But on top of that, he shows video of this aid drop, which is just a photo op. It got so little aid to Palestinians, to Gazans, uh, compared to trucks. Just it got a tiny, tiny amount of the aid they need. But on top of that, the aid killed multiple people. Uh, I believe at least five. And in the footage that he shows, it's very hard to see, but in the footage he shows, you see the two of the aid packages don't, their parachutes don't open, or maybe they were shot by IDF. I don't know. But two of the aid packages, you see that like legit, he's showing the moment that this aid dropped down and killed people. And he just mentions it as awesome. Look at Joe Biden helping people. Thank you, Gene, so much for the donation. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, you guys probably notice I don't have uh, tons of corporate sponsors. <laughs> so uh, you 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 are the ones that that keep this show going. And if you want to become part of the uh, community, that's over at Locals. That's LeeCamp.net. If you go over there, you can join up with my uh, with my Locals community, and you get my book, uh, Dangerous Ideas, my ebook. You also get. Um, Plenty of other uh, perks. So that's all at linktree.com slash Lee Camp as well. But let's continue with MSNBC for a few minutes. So food, medicine, and other essential items that people in Gaza really need. How do you respond to those who say Israel has gone too far, killed too many people, is preventing aid to go into Gaza and in turn leading to the starvation of kids? No, Israel is not preventing aid from entering. Uh, aid is entering. The problem is that... Ham- <laughs> this, this may be the most ridiculous lies of the whole interview. Israel's not preventing aid for it. Israel's absolutely preventing aid from entering. It's not Gazans stopping the aid from getting in. This is just, this is a level of propaganda lies that's... Hamas, when the food enters Gaza, Hamas is siphoning it, blocking it, taking it, and then reselling it in the black market in order to make money. Uh, And they are, in fact, causing... So here's how you know, without even knowing anything, here's how you know this is lies. There are like a thousand, almost a thousand trucks of aid and food waiting on the Israeli side of the border, not allowed in. Like they're not getting in. If Hamas is stealing the aid, then they would be allowed in, right? Because Hamas has to get the aid to steal it to then sell it or whatever he's saying. But they're on the Israeli side, hundreds of trucks. They're being blocked by Israelis. Some of them, sadly, are idiot civilians who just are like, I want to stop kids from eating food. Uh, but really, it's Israel, the government, that's stopping the aid from getting in. The problem, the, the, there's a lot of food on the Gazan side. The problem is distributing it because Hamas doesn't want to serve its own people. Hamas wants this disaster to inflate, so it'll bring an end. <laughs> <laughs> They want the disaster to inflate. Israel literally bombing civilian infrastructure. Did Hamas do that? Yeah, did Hamas? Did Hamas shut off all the power and all the food and all the water? Did Hamas do that from getting into Israel? Did did Hamas bomb all these hospitals and other uh, infrastructure? Was that Hamas? Of course not. And to the war without the dismantling of Hamas. Look, Reverend Al, we cannot allow a terror state to reside on our borders. They are explicitly telling us right now can't allow a terror state. Well, then Israel is short for this world if we're not going to allow terror states. We're going to do it again and again. We're going to go in and massacre your, your families. We're going to go rape your women again. I can't. Was he talking about Israelis are going to do that or? Because, uh, yeah, that's that's true that Israelis are doing that. By the way, again, he's, he brings up the rape thing that's been at least so far debunked. But they know that's a good talking point. So And again. We have no choice. Would you do anything differently? I, I certainly would be concerned since you asked me about it. Would you do anything differently? Would Al Sharpton do anything differently? He's like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't kill so many kids, I don't think. Uh, women and children and people that are innocent here. And I think that there's people accusing the other side both of being terrorists. I think somebody's got to break this cycle. Uh, but, Re- Reverend, I, I would not accept this uh, symmetry. I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely... saying some people. I'm not uh, saying right, that. I, I would, I'm saying that, yes, you were attacked, but since. Some people calling both sides terrorists. Uh, yeah, buddy, Mr. Former Prime Minister, you are absolutely a terrorist. You are absolutely a genocidal war criminal. So, yeah, you can reject it all you want. It doesn't change the facts on the ground. Uh, you're 100% causing a genocide and killing innocent people. 
Okay, folks, I'm going to wrap up here. But like I said, I do these live streams four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, and they are supported by you. And if you don't get the alerts, I hope you will just show up. But please make sure you click subscribe and click the bell icon. Also, join the free email list. That's another way to find out about a lot of my videos. Join the free email list at leecamp.com. Leecamp.net will take you to my locals page. Leecamp.com. Uh, you can there'll be a pop up that comes up that you just join the free email list, and uh, we can keep fighting together. Thank you guys, honestly, from the bottom of my heart for for giving a shit about these these topics. These topics, what the mainstream media won't bring you, and uh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, and uh, if you haven't seen it, check out my destruction. I destroyed Jordan Peterson. It is at youtube.com slash moment of clarity. Just click the videos tab. Uh, it is there and it just went up yesterday. So check out my destruction of Jordan, Jordan Peterson if you want more content right now. And I'll see you tomorrow. Keep fighting.